Hey everyone, Dave here, and right now I am preoccupied with the other, other Tolkien movies. And TV shows. There's a lot. Dave's obsession. Dave's obsession of the moment. We're all here for Tolkien Adaptation Month because we're celebrating the anniversaries of Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings movies. And last year, I talked about the other Tolkien movies, the animated trilogy. And as far as most fans are concerned, Jackson's two trilogies and Warner Brothers retrofitted trilogy are the nine Tolkien adaptations that exist. But they were all of them deceived, for there are other, other Tolkien movies. Mostly foreign movies, and mostly using the word movie incredibly loosely. And the vast majority of these are available on YouTube with English subtitles, and I'll have a playlist to where I found them all at the end of the video, but uh, these are some real interesting takes on Tolkien. So today I am going to discuss all of the other Tolkien motion picture and television adaptations that I've managed to find, and I'm going through them in order of release. Strap in folks, this is going to be a long one. Our journey begins in 1967. Yes, one year before my favorite Hobbit adaptation, there was... nobody's favorite. The story behind this adaptation has been documented elsewhere, but the short version is Rembrandt Films bought the film rights to The Hobbit, but had to deliver a full-color film by a certain date. And when the budget for their ambitious project wasn't approved, they just sat on the rights, not expecting to do anything until the sudden uptick in popularity of the books pressured them to make the bare minimum of what the contract would consider a film before they could sell the rights back to Tolkien. So yeah, this is pretty much the Roger Corman fantastic four of Tolkien movies, just cheaply rushed out to technically fulfill a contract. But what's the film like itself? Well, it's not very much like The Hobbit, I'll tell you that much. This is the Arkenstone of old. Boy, really taking the heart of the mountain literally there. Suddenly, it was all destroyed by the monster lizard Slag the Terrible. Yep, they renamed Smaug to Slag because this was before the invention of Urban Dictionary. Only three survived the flames. A watchman who slept when the dragon came creeping. You had one job! And you look real bored about your failure to fulfill it. Torin Oakenshield, general of the now destroyed Garrison of Dale. But he's still keeping his rank even if he has nobody to follow him anymore. And Princess Mika Milavana. Ooh, I loved her in the fifth element. Gandalf whispered General Oakenshield. Only the great wizard Gandalf can help us now. Oh, you're just saying that because you're desperate to see another character who was actually in the book. So it has come to pass, said the great wizard, that Dale has been destroyed by Slag, and that he nests on the treasure in the carved halls under Lonely Mountain, just as it is written in the great book. Okay, fine, I'll read the Silmarillion already. Then it is clear that the time has come. The time of the Hobbit. It's the time of the Hobbit for loving. I'm done. So rather than most versions of the story where Gandalf just seems to take a special interest in Bilbo and pushes him to be a burglar, here there is an actual prophecy, not just that the dragon will someday be defeated and the Mountain King will return, but that Bilbo specifically will kill the dragon. You shall lead this group over the impassable barricade mountains, through the impenetrable Mirkwood Forest, across the poisonous desolation of slag, to Lonely Mountain itself, wherein the horrid creature lies. You must creep into the deepest great chamber of the old jewel mines of Dale and kill the fire-spitting dragon slag. A fascinating story, said the small hobbit. And now, if you have all finished your breakfast, it's been a great pleasure to meet you, and I wish you lots of luck and all speed. Okay, that was a legitimately good comic turn there. This short has its moments. That dragon has killed my father and all of my people. He has burned to ashes my golden land of Dale. Now he sits on our treasures and waits his time to strike other lands, maybe even here. No, 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 the Shire's safe from outside world and filmed adaptations. Nothing bad will ever happen to the Shire, no need for any sort of scouring. If you are all afraid, then I shall go alone. Bilbo was shocked. 
He shouted at Gandalf, but this is crazy. She's only a child. Oh, I see. That's why they need Bilbo. It's not the prophecy. The princess just needs a babysitter. The conscripted dragon slayer and the three survivors of Dale struggled across the great barricades. Gandalf the Grey watched from his own distance. He knew well what terror waited along this craggy path. So he'll gladly send the company into danger, but he won't actually be helpful. That depiction of Hobbit Gandalf might be the most faithful part of this adaptation. Anyway, they do the troll scene, except the trolls are called groans for some reason, and Bilbo does the ventriloquism instead of Gandalf, so this is officially the earliest instance of a Hobbit adaptation giving Bilbo more agency than the book gave him. And in the grand scheme of things, this is not a terrible scene to do it in. As they moved forward again across the great barricades, the survivors had a new opinion of their small hobbit dragon slayer. Perhaps he might prove useful after all, thought Torrin Oakenshield. Aw, that would mean something if you had shown Thorin doubting Bilbo and not just pleading with him to join the quest. Suddenly, Bilbo was gone. Oh, maybe he'll find Balin, Dwalin, Feely, Keely, Oin, Gloin, Ori, Dori, Nori, Beefer, Bofer, and Bomber, wherever he is. Down to the roots of the mountain. Down to where there is none but Ulumu. Wait, is this where the 1968 radio version picked up that pronunciation from? Did everybody's least favorite adaptation influence my favorite adaptation? Probably not, it's probably just coincidence because basically nobody saw this film, but huh. A weak and rejected creature found what Gandalf the Grey still seeks, the One Ring of Power. Spoiler alert, we don't actually see the Ring of Power being powerful in this version of the story, not even turning Bilbo invisible. Bilbo did have the ring. See? Perfectly visible. Magically, the One Ring of Power had found its true bearer. Is this also part of the prophecy? That only a hobbit can wield the power of the ring? If so, can the Samwise the Strong fantasy come true? Anyway, they have an uneventful trek through Mirkwood, they find the dragon, Bilbo realizes that they need to shoot him with the Arkenstone, which isn't the worst idea for a Chekhov's gun, it's better than whatever Jackson was doing with the Black Arrow, so he bravely steals the Arkenstone with the token note that it might have been the power of the ring that gave him the bravery, but that sounds like a Michael's secret stuff gambit to me, and they bravely band together to kill the dragon in his sleep. And so he did it just as Gandalf knew he would. And the city of Golden Bells was built again, and Bilbo and Mika reigned there together. But this is crazy! She's only a child! Well, and that's the first known filmed adaptation of Tolkien. It's an inauspicious start to the legacy of Middle-earth on film, to be sure. As an adaptation, it's truncated at best, completely unfaithful at worst, and as a contractual obligation, its existence is crass, to say the least. But even though it's a cheap scam, I don't hate the stylistic choices. I like Adolf Born's artwork here, and the use of still images and narration brings to mind, like, those videos you'd watch in grade school that have, like, Aesop's fables or other classic stories. You know the ones I'm talking about where it'd just be a narrator and illustrations, but it would be on VHS. Am I just old? That's what this feels like, and that's how this works best. You know, if you think of this as The Hobbit, the movie, obviously it's terrible. But if you think of it as, like, another retelling of a children's story that has been retold and retold and changed and adapted throughout the generations, it feels exactly like that. And if Tolkien's goal was to create a mythology for Europe, a true sign that the goal has succeeded is seeing the mythology get retold and remixed over the years, with different versions of the tales being told in different ways, many being wildly inaccurate to the original tale. So on that front, I like that this exists as a piece of Tolkien ephemera, even if just to fuel the meta-narrative of Lord of the Rings being Europe's mythology. It's just wild that technically, this is the officially licensed animated hobby movie, and the Rankin Bass one isn't. That one that so many people love and grew up with, that's just a fan film. But this is the one that's legal. A scam, but a legal scam. Anyway, let's move on to 1971, six years before Rankin Bass's The Hobbit, and seven before Bakshi's Lord of the Rings, for what, as far as I've been able to find, is the first ever filmed adaptation of Fellowship, and the first of many foreign language productions we'll be covering today a Swedish film called Sagan und Ringen. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, but it translates to Saga of the Ring.
This two-part production for Swedish television was directed by Bo Hansen, based on his own album, Music Inspired by the Lord of the Rings. So I guess this is technically as much a music video for a concept album as it is a book adaptation. You can kind of tell. It's kind of an abstract visual representation of the story, but it's certainly creative. There are hand-painted backgrounds with the occasional bit of live action blue screened on, and it also cuts to what appears to be stock footage in the middle. It feels like a kid show, humans in a cartoon storybook world, like a proto Blue's Clues or Well 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 with Slim Goodbody. Again, am I just old? There's also no diegetic sound, it's just voiceover narration as we watch silent footage and, you know, the actors all have an interesting look about them. They all kind of look like they're mumbling their way through something, and the very calm narrator is explaining the world-ending stakes of everything they're discussing. Ja, Frodo. Ringen du håller i fick den allra största makten. Därför kallas den mesta ringen och härskar över dem alla. Also, despite the chroma key, zero attempt is made to make the hobbits smaller than the other folk, which will be a trend in a lot of these productions. Mitt under festen gjorde Bilbo sig osynlig. I like how nobody even notices Bilbo disappearing from his own party. That's the ultimate dream, ghosting a party and nobody cares. You're looking at the master of leaving parties early. Who knew Bilbo was both Tim Canterbury and Jim Halpert? That is an abnormally large ring. I don't know if they're playing to the cheap seats or if it's like meant to be a prop in a 3D movie. I'm pretty sure that basically every single filmed adaptation of Fellowship skips the fact that Mary joins up with Frodo, Sam, and Pippin later. Also, the hobbits all appear to be completely different ages, which is not inaccurate, but I don't think Sam should look like everyone else's dad. Despite both parts together totaling less than half an hour, they cover a lot of the journey to Rivendell. They skip Farmer Maggot and the Barrow Whites, but they include Gildor's tribe, Old Man Willow, Tom Bombadil, meeting Aragorn at the Prancing Pony, and they describe the attack at Weathertop in narration, even though they don't show it. And as far as I found, this is the only filmed depiction of Glorfindel. You don't have to tell me that. We then get the Council of Elrond, where Gandalf tells about being held by Saruman. We don't see Saruman, but we see Gwahir, played by stock footage of a real eagle, and we see Gandalf superimposed under him in one very brief shot. Don't blink, you'll miss it. And we see Shadowfax. Skogfaxe kallar männen i råan honom för. Det bestämdes att nio personer skulle ge sig av till eldsbrutande berget i Mordor. Och kasta ner ringen i domedagsklyftan. De som skulle följa med Frodo blev Sam, Mary och Pippin och Gandalf. Av alverna valdes Legolas och Gimli gick för dvärgarna och vidstige för människorna. That doesn't add up to nine. Did Boromir die already? But in covering basically all of book one and the first two chapters of book two in under half an hour, it naturally rushes through points, so there's no time to dwell on characters' emotions or their journey. Basically, the only emotional beats come in the House of Elrond, where Frodo is in awe of how old Elrond and Gandalf are, and when Sam beats himself up for not bringing rope. It's not a very character-driven version of the story. But, you know, it's more faithful to the plot points of its book than the Rembrandt Hobbit was, and it's an interesting look, once again, at the tale being, like, retold throughout the ages. In this case, literally, because this is an adaptation of an album that was inspired by the book. And it's interesting seeing other cultures take on this story. But now let's move back to the English language, and back to The Hobbit for a 10-part episode of the BBC children's series, Jackanory. You know, if you include the opening credits, this is the only Tolkien adaptation to include Babar. Unless he was one of the only fonts. This was a show that featured actors reading children's stories to the audience to stimulate interest in reading. A sort of precursor to shows like Reading Rainbow and Storytime. Their take on The Hobbit aired in 1979, 
two years after the animated movie. I talked last year about how the text of The Hobbit takes a conversational tone, a tone of someone telling a child a bedtime story, so a show that's literally just actors telling bedtime stories is a good use of the text. The story is narrated by Jan Francis, so that's already more women than Rankin Bass put in their version. In a hole in the ground, there lived a hobbit. Not a nasty, dirty, wet hole, nor yet a dry, bare, sandy hole. No, it was a hobbit hole, and that means comfort. The role of Bilbo was essayed by the late, great Bernard Cribbins, and what a fantastic Bilbo. He doesn't quite surpass Paul Daneman in the radio version as my favorite Bilbo, but he is up there. It's fantastic casting. Uh, well, first, I should like to know a bit more about things, said Bilbo so far still tookishly determined to go on with things. Also, I should like to know about risks, out-of-pocket expenses, time required and remuneration and so forth. By which he meant, what am I going to get out of it and am I going to come back alive? The other roles are split between Maurice Denham, who plays Gandalf, among others. Uh, yes, yes, my dear sir. And I do know your name, Mr. Bilbo Baggins. I am Gandalf. And Gandalf means me. Gandalf? Gandalf! Good gracious me! Not the fellow who used to tell such wonderful tales at parties. Not the man that used to make such particularly excellent fireworks. Oh, I remember those. I beg your pardon, but I'd no idea you were still in business. Oh, where else should I be? All the same, I'm pleased to find you remember something about me. Indeed, for your old grandfather Took's sake... I will go so far as to send you to this adventure. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want any adventures, thank you. Not today. Uh, good morning. And David Wood, who plays Thorin, among others. Gandalf, dwarves, and uh, Mr. Baggins. We are met together in the house of our friend and fellow conspirator, this most excellent and audacious hobbit, to discuss our plans, our ways, means, policy, and devices. Uh, we shall soon start on a long journey. A journey from which some of us, uh, or perhaps all of us, may never return. Like I said, this is actors telling a story, not really filming the story. The visual elements are limited to a couple of props and the occasional cutting to the maps. But hey, unlike Rankin Bass two years earlier, they got the runes right. There is one point that you haven't noticed. You see that rune on the west side and the hand pointing to it from the other runes? That marks a hidden passage to the lower hall. Of course, it does copy Rankin Bass's stupid thing of Bilbo deliberately asking a non-riddle. And there, he found the ring he'd picked up in the passage and forgotten about. <sighs> what have I got in my pocket? Mm, uh, oh, not fair, not fair. It isn't fair, my precious. What have I got in my pocket? No, mm, oh, some. It must give us three guesses, my precious. Three guesses. I was on the fence about whether or not this should even count as a filmed adaptation, since it's more of a filmed abridged table read. But the thing is, it might be the best filmed adaptation of The Hobbit, at least in terms of faithfulness to the text. And anyway, it's really charming, and I wanted to acknowledge it. These episodes have never been released on home video, reportedly because the Tolkien estate blocked them because they did not want to flood the market with too many different Hobbit home videos. That's what the claim is, anyway. Uh, sure, whatever. Uh, reportedly, it was released on audio tape for home purchase at one point, and it's on YouTube, so, you know, watch it on YouTube. Again, I'll have the playlist at the end of the video. And then, six years later, we have the first attempt, to my knowledge, at an actual live-action filmed production of The Hobbit. It's a 1985 Soviet television play whose name translates to... <clears throat> The fabulous journey of Mr. Bilbo Baggins, the Hobbit, across the wild land, through the dark forest, beyond the misty mountains, there and back again. Nobody can adapt The Hobbit to live action without unnecessarily extending something, even if it's just the title. The low budget is immediately apparent when you look at this thing, but you know, it's not really a movie, not even a made-for-TV movie. It's a televised play, so it's like children's theater sets telling this children's tale, and 
I think that could work for The Hobbit. And, you know, I think the handcrafted nature of this whole thing does have a certain charm. Ничего волшебного в хоббитах нет. Они одеваются ярко, башмаков не носят, потому что от природы у них на ногах теплый пушистый мех. This cross between Sean Connery and Dabney Coleman plays the professor who is presumably supposed to be Tolkien himself. I kind of love that as a device. Again, the conversational, telling a child a bedtime story tone of The Hobbit's narration lends itself to having an actual narrator. Why not have it be old Tollers himself? Bilbo is played by this Gordon Jump type here, and man, he really hits that exasperated and overwhelmed note hard. I mean, look at the arrival of the dwarf sequence. <laughs> It's so sitcom-y, just running back and forth, running out of breath. Like, I don't know the reason for Bilbo to take off his scarf when he answers the door and put it back on when he goes back to the dining room, but it is a good bit of business that helps sell how overwhelmed he is. Of course, the visual's kind of overwhelmed, too. I can't really see what's going on in these shots of the foyer, but, uh, you know, it's otherwise a very, very effective version of the sequence, I think. Gandalf is played by the older version of Vincent Price's hairdresser disguise from Theater of Blood. Hello, I'm Butch. This is a surprisingly sinister take on Gandalf, or at the very least, mischievous. Like, he feels kind of prankish. Like, he is just delighting in how miserable Bilbo is through every part of this journey. It's, it's very weird. <laughs> Chip the glasses, crack the plates is, if anything, more organized than most versions of it are, but Bilbo still feels overwhelmed until even he has to get into the spirit of the music. And again, Gandalf is just delighting in how much misery these dwarves are putting this poor hobbit through. Like, did he take special interest in Bilbo just because Gandalf's a bully and this is his chosen victim? We also have another solid version of Misty Mountain's Cold. It might just be a song that it's impossible to get wrong. <laughs> But after that promising start, then things start to get a little rushed. Not to the point of the Rembrandt Films Hobbit, of course, but things are kind of breezed through pretty quickly. Like, Rivendell is completely skipped, and the trolls, wargs, and eagles are all relegated to Bilbo's dream in the Misty Mountains. But also some of them maybe really happened? Yeah, the play better explain that too, since we only saw it in a dream. Like, they have this narrator, and they have no problem using the narrator to just relay plot points that happened off-camera. So why do they need to relegate pretty important plot points to dreams? By the way, Down Down to Goblin Town is not the total jam that Rankin Bass turned it into, but it is still pretty upbeat and accompanied by a ballet from dancers of the Marinsky Theater. <laughs> Behold, the Orc of the Dance. Then we meet Gollum, looking for all the world like a Martian ready to be conquered by Santa Claus, but, you know, it's a good children's theater version of Gollum. And then we get riddles in the dark. Старьё, 
Зубы, моя прелесть, зубы. Run. У нас их шесть. Вот раз, два, три, четыре. But this production also, also does the stupid, deliberate, non-riddle thing. Слушай, что у меня в кармане? Это нечестно. Это нечестно. Это нечестно. Это нечестно спрашивать меня, что у этого мерзкого беггинса в кармане. Нет, ты отвечаешь, что у меня в кармане. Is it just me? Does that not bother other people as much? Like, I really think it fundamentally changes Bilbo's character to have him cheat in a Riddles game and not just fall backwards into something that works even though it shouldn't. But the big difference they make to Riddles in the Dark? Gollum actually sees Bilbo disappear with the ring. А в самом деле, что у меня в кармане? А сейчас посмотрим. Куда он подевался? Мы догадываемся. Это он. Also, Bilbo seems unsurprised that that worked. Like... Did he somehow already suspect that this is what a magic ring would do? Also like Rankin Bass, they skip the pity that stayed Bilbo's hand, which, eh, what you gonna do? They also have Bilbo be way more taunting towards Gollum. And rather than actually follow Gollum out, he just overhears Gollum explain that there is a way out, and, well, that's all the info he needs. And like Rankin Bilbo did with Smaug, he takes the ring off for one last bit of mockery. <laughs> Моя прелесть, прощай и проски мозгами. Why do so many adaptations think Bilbo's best trait is taunting? And again, like Rankin Bass, we skip Bayorn. And since we already had the wargs and the eagles just be in a dream, we go straight from leaving the Misty Mountains to the spiders of Mirkwood, just right outside the cave. And Bilbo's newfound confidence taunting Gollum gives him the confidence to taunt the spiders. <laughs> hey! <laughs> I mean, that's something he actually does do in the book, so I'm fine with it. Then we skip the elves and go straight to Lake Town, where the ballet company returns to dance the prophecies of the Mountain King's return. And this is the first time we're having big folk interact with the dwarves. I thought they just weren't gonna bother with scale, but I guess Gandalf is a hobbit wizard in this universe. Bilbo goes into Smaug's cave, and I can't tell if he's supposed to be wearing the ring and only we in the audience can see him, or if he straight up forgot to wear the ring. If he's not wearing the ring, since we skipped the elves, he basically does not use the ring at all to help on this journey. Which, I guess, is kind of like the Rembrandt Films Hobbit. But he finds the misshapen Arkenstone, and then the Smaug puppet appears. It's kind of adorable. Ха-ха-ха-ха! Я тебя чую! Я слышу твое дыхание! I kind of want to build my own paper mache Smaug after seeing this guy. Smaug attacks Lake Town, and there's no thrush in this version, so Bilbo just personally tells Bard about the weak spot, which at least he relayed the information somehow. Unlike in the Jackson version where just he and Bard found it out separately and Bilbo finding it out doesn't pay off in any real way. Anyway, Bard deals with Smaug quickly. Oh man, the ballet troupe is gonna have to fight themselves. So then the battle of some number of armies happens. Gandalf is just real chipper about the whole thing. Bilbo and Thorin have their deathbed reconciliation. Bilbo goes home. It's not a less faithful adaptation than Rankin Bass's, so whichever one you like better probably depends on which visual style you prefer or which TV movie you have more personal nostalgia for. Six years later, in 1991, there was another Soviet television play, completely unrelated, this time based on Fellowship of the Ring. Yes, unrelated Hobbit and Lord of the Rings movies so close to each other isn't just for American animation studios. This is called Cranidaly, or Guardians of the Ring. This aired once on television in the final days of the Soviet Union, and it was thought to be lost until it was uncovered only last year. Which means that there might be other Tolkien adaptations out there that have yet to be uncovered. Boy, 
No, this video is going to be long enough as it is. I will get to those another time if they ever surface. According to the cast, this was shot in about nine hours spread out over the course of a week. That is a really quick time to shoot a Tolkien adaptation. But, you know, I appreciate the effort. <laughs> It starts out with a lot of footage of black riders and hobbits and a giant foil ring while the ring's poem is put to music. It's abstract and probably confusing if you're unfamiliar with the story, but I kind of dig it. The sets and the locations don't quite mesh with each other, but nothing is as jarring as when it suddenly goes to blue screen. <laughs> I'm not one to judge when it comes to bad keying, but some of these shots probably didn't need to be keyed. There is once again a narrator, played by the fourth McElroy brother here, but for most of the production he doesn't really narrate. They just keep cutting back to his face for reasons I absolutely cannot fathom. He really loves that pipe, so he could still be Tolkien, just a young, sexy hipster Tolkien. <laughs> Maybe it's just to remind the audience that this is all a story. I don't know, it's an interesting choice, but I'm gonna take it to heart. I'm just gonna keep cutting back to myself without making comments. We have to decide who will Бильбо Торбинсу сегодня исполняется 111 лет, ведь хоббиты жили долго, и даже в свои 111 Бильбо выглядит, наверное, на 50, не больше. Ведь когда в душе не живет жадность и злоба, тело долго остается молодым. Well, and when a magic ring unnaturally prolongs your life like butter stretched out over too much bread, but potato, potato. So we start with Bilbo's birthday party, as Bilbo has the greatest mutton chops I've ever seen. Incidentally, this Bilbo is way more patient with Lobelia than most. I know you want me dead, you old bat. Now I am charmed by this. This is a much more accurate Gandalf than the one in Soviet Hobbit. He's got the silly playfulness, but he still has the solemn seriousness, and he does not seem to be laughing at anyone's misfortune. <laughs> The lack of a budget is readily apparent with the outdoor shots that look like the snowboarding video your friend shot on a VHS camcorder in middle school, and the fireworks of Gandalfs, which are... You couldn't even just find stock footage of actual fireworks in the sky to cut to? 
Man, this makes Gua here in that Swedish version look great. <laughs> In the middle of Bilbo's party, Bilbo and Gandalf slip away for a private talk. You should probably tell the narrator about that. He thinks your prolonged life is all about your spirit staying free of greed and malice. Frodo, depending on the angle, looks either like Blackadder or like the lost Kevin McDonald character. The only one who looks more kids in the holly is Gollum. Why won't you let me forget that I have a cabbage for a hand? Where have I seen that motion before? Shadow of the Past is interesting because Gandalf is like good and solemn and Frodo is clearly a whirlpool of attention deficit issues, switching from casually whittling to hiding under a pillow with no notable change in temperament. This is the wormiest Frodo I have ever seen in my life. Again, should probably tell the narrator that's what's going on. Stop lying to me, pal. Gandalf's like a tough guy shaking someone down for the Corleone family. I love it. Какие-то новые чудесные друзья, и они покажут кому надо, где орки зимуют. Орки ужас какой, какие орки? Это враги хоббитов. Это узнаешь. If their entire role can be reduced to the enemy of your species, Frodo should probably know about them already, pal. Come on, Frodo, get a diagnosis already. So in this version, is this another shoehorned-in prophecy, or is it just that only hobbits have the fortitude to withstand the ring's evil? We're never gonna know. Man, people were not kidding about George R. R. Martin drawing from Tolkien. I feel like the winter is coming thing is just to justify the fact that all the outdoor scenes had snow in them, but none of the on-set scenes had snow in them, so they make that part of the magic of Middle-earth. Okay, work with your limitations. And so the hobbits reenact the Camp I Me Love scenes from A Hard Day's Night. Just imagine the mashup yourself. I am not dealing with one of their copyright claims today. 
в трактир пирюка. They encounter Farmer Maggot, who, despite being an innkeeper for some reason, is still a more faithful depiction of Farmer Maggot than Jackson gave us. That's right, Maggot. You stand up to that Nazgul. Hell yeah. You're better than both of Peter Jackson's farmer Maggots put together. I love this maggot. I want a whole series about him. But alas, we must move on to the old forest. Oh yeah, we do a quick outdoor conspiracy on mask, which I'm happy to see, but Gandalf already said the other hobbits would be joining him on the whole journey, so it Seems kind of redundant. Yes, old man Willow bores the hobbits to sleep with an interpretive dance. Песня. Помощь близко. Ребята, за мной. Here comes Bombadil, and he seems like a pretty accurate depiction, except for one interesting detail. Okay, I know that the Russian translations of the book were heavily censored, so did they just not include the line about Bombadil being not quite as big as one of the big folk? It's like they swapped out his Hey Doll, Mary Doll with a Fee Fi Fo Fum. Not only are the Bombadils unnecessarily giant, but Goldberry is the Emma Thompson version of Fraser's ex wife? Well, I was gonna start by singing the Doodlebug song. I wonder who the Lori Metcalf version's gonna be. Ah. Uh, Ah, apparently the Barrow White is played by Puddle's Pity Party. Bombadil saves them from the Barrow Whites by shuffling things around below frame and he sends them on their quest. <laughs> so they get to the Prancing Pony and Barlam and Butterbur appears to just be straight up Basil Fawlty. Good thing Bernard Cribbins wasn't a hobbit in this one. He wants to no, no. Oh. 
Frodo here isn't necessarily trying to keep the low profile he should, and in fact he seems desperate to prove everything's fine, so he jumps up and joins in song rather than being pressured into it. Also, the Brelanders start singing first, so I guess Hey Diddle Diddle isn't a Bilbo original here, it's just a song everybody knows. Makes as much sense as Jackson making it a dwarf standard. <laughs> God, this poor Brie girl just dealing with wormy Frodo dancing up on her. But rather than just accidentally slip the ring on, Frodo just suddenly feels the pressure of everyone in the room staring at him, including Patchy the pirate. So he deliberately disappears, which is a very different characterization for Frodo. <laughs> Barlaman gives the hobbits the note from Gandalf, and Frodo oh so smoothly puts Strider to the test. Such a wormy Frodo. So you know how I talked about last week how Jackson amped up the intensity when Frodo was stabbed at Weathertop? He's basically just on death's door between then and the flight to the Ford? Well, this version amps up the intensity even more between those points by combining them. <laughs> Yeah, Weathertop and the flight to the Ford are all like a single incident, and in terms of abridgment, that's an interesting adaptational choice. Frodo is stabbed at the Morgul Blade. He wakes up in the house of Elrond. I think that works as a condensation tool. So then we have the Council of Elrond, Boromir's there this time, and... He seems to be played by that old friend of Fraser's that John Cleese played. That's it, I've died and gone to hell. <laughs> Why are so many people in Middle-earth either John Cleese, someone from Cheers, or both? I'm sorry, is Legolas played by Lori Loughlin? Lori Loughlorian? Я побывал в замке Скальбург у белого мага Сарумана. Вот объединиться нам действительно надо. Это верно. Но объединиться за тем, чтобы кольцо всевластия стало нашим. Oh God, I'm glad this didn't resurface until well after the glory days of Tumblr. The world is not ready for fangirls of young, queer-coded Saruman. <laughs> Pretty cool that Saruman has the power to provide his own Instagram stickers. Why are you so suspicious, Frodo? This is Gandalf we're talking about. <laughs> okay, choose your fighter, low budget Guahir edition. Какие будут предложения? Рода! Рода! Я предлагаю вернуться назад. Вернуться? Мы можем только с победой. Или, по-моему, с поражением. С позором! Или с позором? Ой, нет! Я предлагаю продвигаться вперед. Я тоже так думаю. 
That's what you were asking everyone? Do we keep going or go home? That's the big decision you needed help with? God, this fellowship is screwed, aren't they? Brother! As far as I found, this is the only filmed adaptation to include the warg attack by Karadras and... Oh my god, I love these Lunar New Year Parade Wargs. I want five for my own. Then we get to Moria, and um... This is where the whole thing kind of just falls apart and gets confusing. I did not edit any of that. Good luck following along! Yep, no Balrog. Gandalf just fell and he can't get up. I like the automatic assumption that because Gandalf fell out of sight, he must be dead. Aragorn might not exactly be a master of object permanence. Then we arrive in Lothlorien. It's not the same kind of sinister that Jackson made Lothlorien, but it's still kind of sketchy with these elves luring the Fellowship into a creepy sleep. We want to stop the It's Я предсказательница Галадриэль, и я говорю, зло непременно порождает зло. Фродо looks into the mirror of Галадриэл. Три в эту волшебную чашу, но не прикасайся к воде. Это я, черный властелин Саурон. Я слежу за вами. Отдай мне кольцо Фродо. Okay, that one had to be a comedic take on purpose, right? That was supposed to be funny. Just like, hey there, it's me, Sauron! Like, okay, I get that, you know, low-budget eye of Sauron, that's how you're gonna do it, but himself narrating, like, th that had to be played for laughs, right? Yeah, In place of a Dark Lord, you would have the ancient Boer from the Princess Bride. Никому не могу доверить кольцо. Прощай. Фродо, вернись. And then, almost right away, it's the breaking of the Fellowship. Frodo and Sam go off in their merry way. And as far as I know, this production team never went on to do the Two Towers. And that was Guardians of the Ring Russian Breakout, and it is really interesting. There are parts that look like a significant improvement over Soviet Hobbit just six years earlier, and then there are parts that look like a significant downgrade from Soviet Hobbit, but it's all just super fascinating seeing this slapdash stage production being filmed of Fellowship of the Ring. I kinda love parts of it, and then other parts are just really hard to watch. Not because, like, it's cringy, like, not because I don't like the earnestness, but just because it's literally difficult to watch. Like, the attempt to do special effects just looks so ugly to me. But there's a lot of other real charm in this movie, and yeah, it's, it's just fascinating. But it doesn't stop there. 
that same year, 1991, yet a third unrelated Soviet team attempted another animated Hobbit production, but it was never complete. Now, I specifically have not been talking about adaptations that weren't made because there are just so many of them. My friends at How Did This Not Get Made covered the broad history, but this one had actual footage leaked and it looks really cool. Sure, it's kind of visually chaotic and overwhelming in certain shots, but look at this stylization, this combination of hand-drawn animation and stop-motion and puppetry. If this film had been complete, maybe it would have been a complete mess. Maybe it would have been terrible. Who knows? But if it had kept up this level of quality through the whole thing, it's possible that this could have been the definitive Hobbit adaptation. Alas, we'll never know, so we can only speculate on what might have been. But now we move on to two years later, 1993, for a different television production in a different European country, Finland. This is Hobbitit, or The Hobbits. We've got Tolkien turned into Russian fairy tale movies. We've got Tolkien turned into Finnish fairy tale movies. Before this, my only experience with either Russian or Finnish fairy tale movies was Jack Frost. Now, considering Finnish is one of the primary languages that Tolkien drew from when developing its own, I think it's only right that Finland had its own crack at a Lord of the Rings adaptation. And this was a nine-part television version of Lord of the Rings based on a six-hour play that told the story of the whole trilogy, but focused on Frodo and Sam, which means that large battles could be left out, which, you know, not a bad way to do it. So, much like Rankin Bass's Return of the King, this puts all the focus on the two hobbits. And also like Rankin Bass's Return of the King, it means they can really focus on their emotions. Don't worry, it's handled better here than it is in Rankin Bass's Return of the King. In fact, the story is narrated by an older Sam telling the tale to hobbit children. I really like that as a device, even more than I like in-universe Tolkien as a narrator. It makes sense that the hobbit who's keeping up the Red Book of Westmarch would be the one who's telling the tale to future generations. Hey, can I get some Sonaka for the story? Episode 1 is a little shadow of the past, but it's mostly riddles in the dark. The only major adaptational change to the latter is, much like in the 85 version, Gollum actually sees Bilbo put on the ring. <laughs> oh yeah, usually when someone puts on the ring, there's an explosion when they disappear. This might be a nod to Gandalf setting off a firework when Bilbo disappears at the party in the book, but it just happens indiscriminately, which is an odd choice. <laughs> but unlike the 85 version, or the Rankin-Bass production, they keep the pity that stays Bilbo's hand. In fact, Sam really, really emphasizes it. Bilbo joutui kiusaukseen surmata Sääli esti häntä toteuttamasta aikea. Lasi kotiin seikkailultaan kesäkuun kaadentena kymmenentenä toisena päivänä. I like these establishing shots using scale models. They're really cute. 
They're a little Thomas the Tank Engine-esque. From the Isle of Sodor to the Land of Mordor. So then we have Bilbo's birthday, and this older Bilbo doesn't have the button chops, but he sure does have the facial hair of a dwarf. These foreign Gandalfs keep on getting better and better. During the serious moments, this is the most solemn Gandalf we've seen yet, but he also has the warmth and playfulness he needs in his friendship with the hobbits. Tämä on Herra Sormus. Se Sormus, joka Sauron kadotti kauan sitten. Hän himoitsee Sormusta kovin, mutta hänen ei tule sitä saada. I really like how he plays his temptation by the ring. Sinä olet viisas ja mahtava. Ota sinä tämä Sormus. We were this close to Dark Lord Gandalf, weren't we? Sormuks. Mikäköhän vuoksi? Voi sitä kyllä olla hyötyä. This Frodo is not nearly as wormy as Soviet Frodo. In fact, he gets pretty gruff. Onko mitään toivoa, että se ikinä onnistuu? Ja jos onnistuu, onko todennäköistä, että me, sinä ja minä, enää ikinä tarvitsemme leipää? I think that's supposed to be the power of the ring weighing on him because his voice is getting really close to Gollum's voice. Speaking of Gollum... I have not found any confirmation about whether or not Andy Serkis ever saw this production, but I wouldn't be surprised if he did because this is very close to the Gollum we know and love today, other than being played by a live actor in makeup. A live actor who incidentally is the same actor who plays Aragorn in this. Again, I assume that's a holdover from stage where roles are doubled up, but um, I'm not sure what the point of doubling up those two characters are. Like, usually in a play, when major roles are doubled up, there's a thematic reason. Like, in most stage productions of Peter Pan, Captain Hook and Mr. Darling are the same actor, but uh, I don't know what we're getting out of Gollum and Aragorn being the same actor, other than they don't have any scenes together. But the guy's good at both of them. Sormusta ei voi enää piilotella. Konnussa. Itsesi ja muiden takia sinun on lähdettävä repun päästä. So the hobbits head to the old forest, which, based on the music, seems to be in Eddie Valiant's office. Willow, who swallows the hobbits up using clip artifacts. And we get an older, chiller, more mellow bombadil. And a mostly off camera Barrow White, which Tom shows up to deal with without the hobbits even singing for help. Voice This Bombadil's not bad, but I feel like the inexplicable Soviet giant is still the most accurate, other than the inexplicable giant part. Vanhat veitset. Käyvät hopitti kansalle miekoista. 
There is one scene that's added that's not in the book and doesn't focus on Frodo and Sam, and I imagine it was a scene added in the play version for a set change or something. We actually do see Gandalf give the letter to Barlam and Butterbur, and uh, it pretty much sets up their dynamic pretty well. Anatema viestianil. Viljami. Eh? Muista. Mikä? Viesti. Vie! Juu, juu, voit luottaa minun. He couldn't. They arrive in Bree, and this features the best depiction of the start of the Hey Diddle Diddle scene, with all of the awkwardness of Frodo pulling attention away to start the song. <laughs> But it still looks like Frodo pretty deliberately puts on the ring for reasons that aren't entirely clear, which I guess it's hard to film the ring accidentally slipping on his finger. What you gonna do? They meet Strider and they continue on their journey. Sitä paitsi sormus vetää niitä puoleensa. Eli jos minä liikun, minut nähdään. Jos taas pysyn paikallani, vedän ne puoleen. Sinä et ole yksin, Frodo. This Frodo? is great. He captures the devastation he feels in the futility of the quest. No matter what choice he makes feels like the wrong one, but he can't just do nothing. like Soviet Fellowship, this also conflates Weathertop with the flight to the Ford, and yeah, it's just a good, efficient way to do it when you got to abridge things anyway. If I were Frodo, I'd probably be a bit alarmed to be waking up in Rivendell since it looks so much like a low-budget heaven, but hey, time for the council. Unnecessary facial hair aside, I also dig this Elrond. He's not given a whole lot to do, but he has a great presence. I love how Gimli is just every techie in your college theater department. And now, the moment you have all been waiting for, Samurai Boromir! Antakaa minun ensin kertoa Gondorista, sillä totisesti Gondorin maasta olen minä tullut. Olisi hyvä kaikkien tietää, että vain meidän uljaatemme pitää jo aloillaan idänvillit kansat ja Mordorin kaavut puolustusasemissa. Another thing that the Peter Jackson production may have taken from this is moving the discovery that Frodo's wearing Mithril to right after he gets stabbed in Moria and not a little ways after they get out of Moria. Yeah, there's no need to wonder. We have the answer, Gandalf. Also much like Soviet Fellowship, there's no Balrog, and Gandalf just kind of seems to slip and fall, which uh, kind of takes away from all that great gravitas we've been seeing from him elsewhere. Still, at least it is confirmation that Gandalf actually fell, unlike Soviet Aragorn just kind of guessing. God, where have I seen that blue screening before? Oh yeah, I myself did it in 2003. 
Ha, you're gonna have to dig deep back in the Patreon if you want to see any more of that. Hyvästi, Gandalf. Eikö minä sanonut sinulle, että jos kuljet Morian porteista, niin varo? Well, you didn't on camera. Then they get to Lothlorien and, um, Galadriel is the lady in the lake. Or the reflection of the lady in the lake. Tervetuloa, Aragorn, Aratornin poika. Galadriel Valtiatar. So Galadriel just lives inside her own mirror? Interesting take. Inka minä tule olemaan musta. Vaan kaunis ja kauhea. Kuin alo ja yö. Ihan kuin meri. Aurinko ja vuorten lumi. They keep Gimli falling in love with Galadriel, and this Gimli is giving it his all. Miksi tuli mukaan tätä tehtävää täyttävää? But it is kind of the last thing Gimli has to do in this story, and Legolas gets even less to do. No wonder Rankin Bass just cut them all together. So Samurai Boromir tries to take the ring, so Frodo and Sam go off on their own. Boromir regrets his decision, but is killed, and we actually see Aragorn's personal crisis and self-doubt. That's right, give me that vulnerable Aragorn, baby. You know I love it. But then we just follow Frodo and Sam for the rest of the story. Narrator Sam just kind of fills in the blanks on what happened off screen. Another thing they do that Jackson would do later is move the discussion about it's a pity Bilbo didn't stab the vile creature to significantly after Shadow of the Past, except they change even more about it. Yeah, they give Frodo's lines to Sam and Gandalf's lines to Frodo. Having Frodo be the one who imparts this wisdom onto Sam really turns Sam into the true protagonist of this story, and I'm all for that. Sometimes Frodo's gruffness makes him seem a little impatient with Sam, but he still does actually appreciate Sam. It's a tricky thread. And yes, their take on Sauron is similar to the Soviet take on Sauron, but not nearly as goofy. I think it does work a lot better here. Faramir is completely skipped, which is better than what Jackson did to him. And much like the Balrog, Shelob is not seen, but she is mentioned by name as being off camera. It's just another scene of confusion as Frodo is clearly poisoned by something. <laughs> Yeah, basically the place that this show falls apart is anywhere there's a giant creature. Look at our size! But Sam rescues Frodo, they make their way up the mountain, Gollum attacks them, and because they drove it home so hard before, of course they keep Sam's pity for Gollum. Oh, <laughs> 
I was said that I think your eyes really... Then the actual climax is kind of rushed, but you know, low budget. Are... No, no! So that's just how people fall in this version of Middle Earth, huh? I wonder if they go clockwise in Finland and counterclockwise in New Zealand. <laughs> then Sam wakes up in another heaven-looking room to be greeted by someone he thought was dead, but he's as okay with it as anybody could be. <laughs> You know, I'm okay with the way they've been rushing through set pieces if it means getting these extended scenes of characters processing their emotions. This series has a grasp on Frodo and Sam that a lot of other adaptations lack. It probably comes from the fact that this adaptation was originally written for the stage. It's much easier to do characters processing their emotions on stage than it is to do, you know, big action scenes. And this is what you go to the theater for, to hear characters processing their emotions. Or to see big musical numbers, but this isn't that kind of show. But do you know what the best thing about this production is? Do you want to know? Do you want to know what the best part of this is? They keep the scouring! Well, okay, they keep part of it. They don't actually show the hobbits confronting Saruman, but the scouring happens in this version. Is it everything I want from a scouring depiction? No, it's still this low-budget television version based on a play. It's still not perfect, but they have the scouring. As far as I know, this is the only film depiction of the scouring of the Shire. It's not the complete scouring. It's not even like a third of the scouring. I'll take what I can get. Mutta Frodo ei tullut koskaan entiselle. Ja eräänä iltana hänen aikansa oli tullut. So Frodo leaves, but not before taking one more line from Gandalf. Minä en sano, älä itke. And we get this I will remember you montage, which is kind of cheesy, but shut up, it's working on me. And then Sam finishes his story, and then he goes off towards the Undying Lands to be with Frodo. That's a nice way to end this. I like this version. Of course, not everything in it works. Some of the things that don't work are a result of their own limitations. Some of them are just creative choices that I really think are weird. But it's a mostly functional version of the complete trilogy. You know, just skipping over parts Frodo and Sam aren't in. And as far as I can tell, before Jackson came along, this was the only filmed production to finish the trilogy. And including Jackson, it's still the only production to finish the trilogy because it includes the scouring. So if nothing else, it deserves a lot of credit for that. Then the Jackson movies came along and people thought doing new takes on Tolkien was a fool's errand when everybody loved those so much. But of course, there was another Tolkien adaptation, not of his writing, but of the man himself.
Yeah, I bet some of you forgot this happened. I kind of did too, and I just watched it an hour ago. Tolkien is a 2019 biopic that was in the English language, but the director is from Finland, so that kind of ties it back to the previous adaptation I was talking about. Kinda. This movie has its moments. The actors are all good, and there are a couple of scenes that I actually really liked, but it's overall just standard schmaltzy biopic fare. And there's a reason that biopic is a genre that now has three, count them, three essential feature-length parody movies. I think part of the problem is that the things that most Tolkien readers really want to know about his life are things that are inherently uncinematic. Like, we want to learn about him actually crafting the legendarium. We want to learn about him getting the ideas, writing out, creating this world. And that would just be a guy either sitting at a desk or a guy just having conversations about, you know, I was thinking maybe spiders would be big. The ways this movie does tie in with the legendarium are having Tolkien basically hallucinate fantasy elements while he's on the battlefield which I get it as a device, but it's really reductive. Like everyone knows that Tolkien's time in the war definitely influenced his writing, but the manner and degree to which it influenced his writing is a subject of debate and has been basically since his books were published. And reducing it all to he saw a flamethrower and hallucinated a dragon really does a disservice to, well, everything. The parts I really like in this movie is when Tolkien is having conversations about language, his one true passion. I think that's nonsense. I mean, it is if you say it like that. A word isn't beautiful just because of its sound. Cellar door. It's the marriage it of sound and meaning. The door to the cellar. A place where something magical and mysterious might happen. Sorry, have, have you just dismissed the basis of my entire language? Your language isn't worth anything unless you remember this important fact. Oh, is that right? It is, yes. But those conversations really harp on the fact that words are beautiful because they have meanings. So when this movie ends with him inventing a word with no explanation for the meaning of that word... Now, to be clear, I think it would have been really bad if they had said, oh, he chose the name Hobbit because they reminded him of hobnobs. Like, if they had shoehorned in a fake meaning behind the syllables in the word Hobbit, that would have been bad too. It just sits in sharp contrast with everything else the film was saying about language. But yeah, this movie ends with old toddlers about to start writing The Hobbit, so it's basically the Walt before Mickey of its time. You don't remember that movie happened either, did you? I'll talk about that another time. I get what they were going for with ending with him writing the famous opening line, but also that is inherently an uncinematic thing to happen because the phrase just popped into his head randomly, seemingly unmotivated by anything other than his own boredom, and that is not a satisfying conclusion to a movie. The film also, you know, takes liberties with Tolkien's life, as all biopics do, and the Tolkien estate put out a statement saying they did not participate in, nor do they endorse this movie, but, you know, they didn't really endorse Jackson's movies either, and everyone loves those, so that's not necessarily a sign of quality. But when you're talking about a man's life, it helps make it feel more authentic if you actually talk to the people who are caretaking that man's legacy. I think the only way to do a Tolkien biopic that would actually give Tolkien fans what they want, like get into his creative process and everything, would be to make it a movie about the Inklings. Have them meeting at the Bird and Baby, have them discussing their processes, discussing their stories, developing their ideas, having them all together. And apparently there was a Tolkien and Lewis biopic that was in development, but it got scrapped before this one came out, so that one probably wouldn't have been great either, but it could have had more of the scenes that Tolkien fans want. But, you know, if you like biopics, this one is fine. Anyway, I guess I should talk about the most recent adaptation. I don't really want to. Not because of the show itself, but because the discourse is frankly exhausting. On the one side, you've got the dumbest people in the world mad that there are some actors who aren't white on the show, or that a girl is a good fighter and they're yelling at Neil Gaiman about it. Again, dumbest people in the world. On the other side, you have the very legitimate concern that this Tolkien adaptation can only legally use material from some of the books, books that barely touch on the era the show is set in, so most of the show has to be made up from whole cloth. And that exacerbates the issue you get with any Tolkien adaptation, the fact that all this lore was created by one man, 
and now a team has to figure out how to filter it to a different medium and capture that man's spirit without that man's input. But on the plus side, you do have the fact that the Tolkien estate worked much more closely with the creators of this adaptation than just about any other Tolkien adaptation, but that's still not the same as the man himself working with the creators of this adaptation. And oh yeah, then there's the Oliphant in the room that this Tolkien adaptation is being funded by the actual real life Sharky. This is all the stuff you have to wade through before you even watch the show. Oh my God, this discourse is exhausting. And then and then, you have the uphill battle of first time showrunners being tasked with making modern prestige mystery box television and condensing the events of an entire age into a much shorter span of time, when really the best way to cover the Second Age would be an anthology series, so that we can really spread out the time frame and not need to follow the same characters in every episode. We already have plenty of episodes that regular characters don't show up in. This was an option. I mean, basically, the entire Harfoot subplot in Season 1 could have been a two-part episode on its own had it not cut to all the other subplots. Hell, go in the opposite direction. Each race or kingdom of Middle-earth could have gotten its own TV series. But barring that, each season could include, like, a handful of Numenor episodes, a handful of Moria episodes. Like, there were ways to do this that would cover the vastness of Middle-earth without really compressing it and making it feel so small. But whatever. For whatever reason, these were the decisions that were made, this was the show they were tasked with making. And hey, I talked just last week about how I liked when Jackson compressed the timeline, so compressing the second age down to a five season arc isn't entirely a deal breaker for me. So I watched the first season of Rings of Power. Do I like the show? I like it enough to wish that I liked it more. There are things that I really enjoy in it. I enjoy the breathtaking vistas, seeing Numenor and Khazad Doom in their former glory. I like all of the actors, and I like most of the character relationships. I'm legitimately invested in the friendship between Elrond and Durin, and the developing relationship between Arondir and Bronwyn, and the sisterhood between Nori and Poppy, and they're taking care of the stranger, this whole Iron Giant, Frankenstein's monster dynamic they've got going on. I love Adar as a villain. I think he's great. I love the Harfoots, I love the Dwarves, I love so much of what's going on, and then there's just so much other stuff that bores or annoys me. I spent the entire season just having zero feelings about Halbrand, good or bad, until the final episode when the feeling I had was basically, oh. And while I liked seeing Numenor itself, the Numenorians as people seem kind of stupid. Elendil and Muriel are the only ones who seem to have a hint of the Numenorians of legend. I'm sure Isildur will grow into his own, but he's not there yet. I was impressed by the Numenorian landscape, underwhelmed by the Numenorian people. Speaking of growing into their own, I really do dig Warrior Galadriel, but I wish it was tempered with Galadriel's actual wisdom, because boy does she spend most of the season being blinded by revenge, a trait that I could see taking Galadriel for maybe a moment, but not for this long. And I suspect that they're setting up an arc to have her grow into her wise self that we all know, but she should already have more wisdom than this. But there's still a lot of what I love from Tolkien and Tolkien adaptations in the show. Tolkien's often contradictory themes of great men rising to the occasion and small acts from humble people turning the tide are both at play here, and I think they're both handled well. And yes, there are other things that don't feel Tolkien-esque that take me out of it, but that's true of just about every Tolkien adaptation, no matter how good. That is handsome, Orc. Ultimately, this first season had some high highs, though not nearly as high as the highs of the Jackson Rings trilogy, and some low lows, though not nearly as low as the lows of the Jackson Hobbit trilogy. I liked it enough to keep watching next season, and I hope it gets even better. I think every single problem that I personally have with the show stems from applying modern sensibilities to this lore. Now, I don't mean making it woke, because if that's legitimately a thing you're complaining about, don't worry, you'll be old enough to get a learner's permit someday. I'm talking modern, capitalistic, studio-driven filmmaking sensibilities. Trying to reach all four quadrants, drive engagement, all those good boardroom buzzwords. I'm not definitively saying that the problems were all from studio mandates. Maybe this was the show the writers wanted to make. Maybe it's even the show that told estate wanted, but the sensibilities that led to these decisions, whoever made them, were influenced by the way modern content is. And as much as I love a lot of modern shows and movies that are made with these same sensibilities, marrying those sensibilities to Tolkien's world felt hollow to me. But that's the cultural landscape this show was made in. Just like all these other adaptations were made in their own cultural landscapes, with all the good, the bad, and the confusion that entails. And as such, 
Even if I don't love all the results, or even if I think the attempt itself may have come from a misguided place, I can still appreciate the attempt to filter Tolkien through this lens, just like I can appreciate all these other attempts. Every adaptation I've talked about today brings something different to the table. They were all made by different people for different reasons, and whether influenced by outside forces or from their own creative passion, they all put their own spin on Tolkien. Some of those spins are definitely not the spin I would have put on Tolkien, but it doesn't matter, because the original text is still there. Having more versions of it does not ruin Tolkien. And like I said at the beginning, having all these different interpretations that don't all fit together, don't all make sense together, that just really makes Middle-earth feel like the folklore, like the myth that Tolkien wanted it to be. It makes it feel like a story that has been passed down from generation to generation. Some things have gotten lost in the telling, some things have gotten embellished in the telling, but all of this serves the purpose of making Middle-earth feel real even if some of these depictions of it feel really fake. And that, as far as I've been able to find, is every other Tolkien movie or television show that wasn't just made for the internet. I'm not getting into fan films today. I'm tired. Of course, there are other takes on Tolkien, takes that don't even attempt to be reverent, takes that make, dare I say it, fun of Tolkien. And we'll get into those next week. But in the meantime, have you seen any of these? You can watch them all. They are all available either on YouTube or elsewhere. And if you've seen them, what do you think? Which one of these is your favorite? Which one of these do you think is the best? Which one do you think is the worst? Which one is the most baffling? Which is the most interesting? What are your feelings on all these Tolkien takes? And have you found another one that I somehow missed? Let's discuss this all in the comments. And until next week, this is Dave signing off.